I'm back? There you go. You're the yeah. first person that ever requested to uh, uh, see my face live again. You're like, it's frozen. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, you know, Aspen is the only, um, in my opinion, a rollout where they have a brand name. Every location is Aspen. Uh, they're right. branding it out. They all have a similar... Um, I, I, I think it's the most closest to a, a prototype rollout. And I also think they have the most focus um, because they're focused on underserved areas and they want to work Medicaid and Medicare. I mean, not Medicare, Medicaid. Yeah. And uh, so that, that's actually a branded target um, going after, you know, the like, like out here in uh, Phoenix, every all the dentists want to go to North Scottsdale. They want to go where all the money is. None of them. Uh, they're, they're, we still don't have a dental office in Eloy. I mean, Eloy is just 30 miles south of here and doesn't have a dentist. Across the street um, from me is Guadalupe. Guadalupe doesn't have a dentist. And, and, and As Aspen's saying, we, we're going to go where the dentists aren't going, and, uh, and we'll, we'll work the Medicaid uh, mill. And uh, that's yep. pretty interesting. Um, talk, let's switch gears completely to the, the dental insurance landscape, because I know you're doing a lot of pioneering work with your membership program. What do you think of the state of dental insurance that basically uh, started in 1948 with the Longshoremen's Union, where every single container that came in and out of America went through the Longshoremen's, and they were the first ones that um, union against their boss saying, we, we want dental insurance. That eventually turned out to uh, uh, Delta of Washington, Delta of Oregon. Uh, basically, that, that's where it started. And now, now it's 2017. Where do you think dental insurance fits the model? Um, and, and what are your thoughts on your new membership program? Yeah, so I think, uh, you know, dental insurances get a little bit bad of a rap in the sense that, you know, I think they've done a lot of good in the industry, um, in bringing more awareness around the importance of oral health, right? And they've got a lot of people to buy into dental insurance and carry dental insurance, which which helps. Um, I think there is a pretty massive opportunity, though, um, for some innovation. I think we we have essentially the same product. Um, it's been the same product for I mean, how many years, Howard? Over forty. Well, 19, 1948. I mean, it really hasn't changed. Yeah. So this is uh, I uh, So this is twenty seventeen, right? Yeah. Twenty seventeen minus nineteen forty eight. I mean, it's been sixty nine years. Sixty nine years. And, yeah. And, and it still so has still the same max, it. and it's the same one thousand dollar maximum. Nothing's changed, and so the problem with dental insurance is it's really not designed to get people healthy, right? Um, they stick, they, their waiting periods, their yearly maximums, um, you know, and, and so people tend to, and dentists tend to treatment plan around what their insurance covers. And so they put off needed dental treatment. Uh, and a lot of people actually never use, they'll don't over 50% of those who carry and pay for dental insurance, never even use it. Right. Uh, in some areas it's like 80%. So um, it, that model is kind of broken. And I think you're going to see, um, and, and it's really at the end of the day, it's, it's nothing more than a discount plan. Not that many people uh, will go out and buy dental insurance on the private market uh, because it's, you know, it's 400 bucks a year, covers a couple free cleanings, um, but then it's, you're pretty much out of pocket for most things. And so if you do the math, you know, unless your employer is, is subsidizing your product, most people, when you talk to them, they actually don't even know how much they're paying for the dental insurance. I mean, how often does that happen ever where people have no idea what they're paying for? They have no idea how much monthly their employer is taking out of their paycheck, nor do they really understand what it's covering. So, the, I mean, there are, there are a ton of challenges with it. And so, you know, um, so when I was at Harvard Business School, we did a study. Um, I did a study with uh, a really um, well-known figure in healthcare named Regina Herzlinger. Oh um, my God! She, I loved her books. She's she wrote what? What was the, her first book? Was it Health versus Wealth? Yeah, and then she uh, she wrote Who Killed Healthcare. She's 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 written great great works and, and, uh, and does, she's does a, she still brilliant. teach? Yeah, she's brilliant. She is absolutely brilliant. Is she is she your and, friend? I mean, do you have her email or contact? Oh yeah, for sure. Oh she my God, are, fixes that. That'd be the ultimate podcast. I've quoted that woman so many times in my over the years. I mean, she's just a <laughs> brilliant genius. She was one of the biggest early influence. Oh, she was the pioneer of healthcare macroeconomics in my mind. Absolutely, yeah. A lot of people call her the godmother of uh, 
of consumer driven healthcare, right? She's, she is the influencer on Capitol Hill when it comes to healthcare. And so um, she actually gave a, a talk at a, a leadership seminar um, when I was in dental school. And I was only, I think I was a second year. And she, she said in that seminar, she said, you know, and there were, but there were a bunch of leaders from the dental industry that were there in attendance. And I just asked the dean of my school if I could go <laughs> just to see what people were talking about. And he let me. So um, I heard her say at that seminar, um, look, I've never written, actually written a case on the dental industry uh, at HBS. And if any of you are interested, um, let me know. So I remembered that when I got into HBS and I contacted her. And so she and I uh, wrote a, a study on the dental industry. Um, and actually, we we're going to write it on a DSO, but we actually didn't find one with an interesting enough story to, to, to write a case on. Um, and in that process, that's what gave me the access to kind of, um, uh, you know, visit with all these um, CEOs of the DSOs and all that. But we ended up doing uh, our study on a Brazilian dental insurance company, uh, which gave me the opportunity to go to, to, to Sao Paulo and eat, eat the best steak I've ever had in my life. I don't know what they do to their steaks down there, but it was, oh my gosh, I still dream about it. Um, but we, uh, we ended up writing a case on a dental insurance company called Odontoprev. And I'll send you the article, Howard. It's pretty interesting. Um, but Did you I got publish to, it? Yeah. Uh-huh. Yep. Where it's published, it? and she actually teaches it at her course. Where, where was it East published? Point. Just in Harvard Business uh, Review. It's, oh, it's, just, um, just in Harvard what? Business Review? <laughs> Just in Harvard. Actually, I'm not sure if it's in HDR. I'm not sure, but it's it's available. Um, it's taught in in her course. She teaches a course called Healthcare Innovation in Healthcare, and um and so she she teaches that in her course. Um, you're, you're only you're the only the second guy I know who's been published in Harvard Business Review. The other one is actually Chuck Cohen, uh, who's uh, uh him and his brother Rick Cohen own um. Benko, their third generation, oh, Benko, yeah. and, and Harvard uh, Business Review was uh, doing an article on uh, family-owned businesses and what happens to them as they pass down from generation to generation, and uh, Chuck uh, wrote a piece in there. That was very cool. So congratulations on that, man. You're a unicorn. Well, <laughs> um, so yeah, in her course, um, so we traveled, we saw, basically I saw, um, I got to visit with their corporate team and learn uh, the insurance business in in Latin America. They're, O'Donnell Press is the biggest uh, dental insurance player in Latin America. Um, and they had a bunch of different products. Um, but they had one that involved a clearance process that got people healthy. And then what they found after that clearance process is was that the, um, the costs of that patient once they were cleared were very predictable, Right. And so their whole goal was, you know, let's let's get rid of all these waiting periods, the uh, yearly maximums. Let's just focus on getting people healthy. And once they did that, their costs were super low. So we've uh, we've designed a membership that's very similar to that, that involves a clearance process, no no waiting periods, no caps. We just want to get you healthy. We give we give you healthy um, discounts on the front end, and then once we get you healthy, then pretty much everything that relates to keeping you healthy going forward is covered under the membership. So essentially crowns, fillings, extractions. Um, once you're a cleared member, Howard, let's say you came in um, and you know you had a cavity. We fix your cavity, you're cleared, you're a member. Next time you come in, you need another filling, it's completely free. Or you need a crown, completely free. So everything that relates to keeping you healthy on an ongoing basis is covered at 100%. We've been developing that now for about three years and um, the economics on it um, are are looking really strong, and uh, we we see it as being a very um, disruptive um, de- dental product on the insurance side. You're going to see a lot, lot of players in in my mind in the next five to ten years come in this space. And if the you know if the dental insurance companies don't innovate, um, other other players will. So I think there are some serious challenges on the horizon for um, for dental insurance, I think dental insurance, the way that we see it now, is going to be extinct in, in five years, I'd say. Ten years at the latest. Holy moly, that's a big prediction. But, I mean, you're right. They haven't done anything. The biggest proof is uh, 
This is 2017. Jobs came out with the iPhone, the smartphone, in 2007. A decade later, you walk into any dental office in America, and they have to bring in paper forms. And then if they yep. really want to figure out what's going on, they, they don't trust the website. they got to call a live human. And then I've sat down with my staff where we will have three different people call the exact same dental insurance company, asking him the exact same thing and get oh three yeah. freaking different answers. And it's like, ask them if they have Delta Dental, why don't they just come in my office and open up their Delta Dental app and there's some barcode and then we scan it and then that tells me everything. And that was what was so um, um, sad about um, Obamacare because – he had a big heart. I mean, he wanted to get rid of pre-existing conditions and let kids stay on their parents still, but they didn't do one thing to address the cost. And 30% of the cost of healthcare is pushing paper around. And these medical insurance and dental insurance companies haven't tried or done anything to, to try to get rid of that. I mean, that it should be that part of the equation should be a utility that shouldn't cost more than one to three percent. You shouldn't have to be spending 30% of all the people in every hospital, medical practice, and dental offices filing forms. And I mean, it's just, it's completely maddening insane. It is insane. Yeah. I mean, we, we hire a full-time team to just manage the complexities of dental insurance. Um, there's, there's, a, there's probably at least 15 to 20% of inefficiency costs baked in that product. And so, you know, someone's going to come in and, and innovate. And, you know, we as a company, that's, that's kind of our mantra is, is we want to shake this industry up. We see an industry that's pretty stale, um, hasn't been innovated in a long time. Um, and, you know, our goal is to make your next trip to the dentist more convenient, more affordable and, and enjoyable, fun. We believe that a trip to the dentist can actually be fun. So are you going to develop like an app for this insurance? So, I mean, will it, will it use a smartphone technology or... I mean, eventually, eventually an app will come. I mean, um, initially, uh, you know, we're looking, I can't really talk about exactly the strategies that we're pursuing, but we need to, um, to pilot it for a little bit longer um, and get more data back. And then once we do that, we can start rolling it out um, on a larger scale. And, and then that's where the apps and stuff comes in. But the one other thing I'd say about the, the membership is um, technology. Technology is, is really important. And we need to bring technology into the product to drive behavior. And so how do you do that? Um, I think, you know, it's been our, our vision from the beginning that we want to bring uh, smart toothbrushes uh, into the product at some point, um, which, will, which will reward people for brushing their teeth and provide discounts on their insurance products. Um, we can also do other perks inside our clinics like Invisalign and whitening and, and things, but we, th we think using technology as a way to drive behavior is very important. Um, I would say the, the company that's probably doing uh, something interesting there is Beam, Beam Technologies. Have you heard of them? For the smart toothbrush? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, they're, they've built a, basically a Dell insurance product on their uh, smart toothbrush. Um, but we see introducing that at, at some point as well into the process. But anyway, yeah, the, other, the last thing I'd say about our industry – is the incentives, right? The incentives are so messed up. Um, I'm paid based on my production, right? You're a patient. Our incentives run directly against each other. What I would like to see with our membership, too, is, is to see our providers compensated based on outcomes, uh, quality outcomes, instead of being paid on how much they produce. Um, and I hope that as we, as an industry, as we look at innovative ways um, – uh, to restructure the way that uh, incentives are, are built, which right now is completely backwards. I'm hoping that we can find ways where we can align incentives be between patients and, and providers so that we are compensated based on keeping patients healthy, not based on finding as much as we can wrong with them and um, uh, trying to you know create these expensive treatment plans, et cetera, et cetera. That's what I'd like to see. And that's what I hope we can develop with our, our membership product as well. Yeah, the incentives in healthcare, you're right, they're completely insane. I mean, uh, they want to do a $100,000 bypass. They don't, they don't, want, they don't want to sit there and try to get you to prevent a heart attack. I mean, they're, they're right. I mean, when I went to MBA school, there were 200 people in my class at Arizona State University, and all 200 of them um, had rejection letters from Harvard Business School. And uh, so we were the uh, 
we were the the island of misfits out there in Tempe. But uh, but no, those, those hospitals said the the incentives were insane. Like um, they lose money on all their visits in the hospital. But if the hospital has to do three to four major surgeries a day, because because Medicare Medicaid will give them a hundred thousand dollars for a bypass, seven to eighty thousand dollars for a mastectomy. Um, you know they'll give them you know fifty thousand for a knee. You know eighty thousand for a hip. And they have to they have to keep that surgeries going because everything else runs at a loss, and yeah. so the whole thing is driven by you. You want that one Medicaid check for a hundred grand? You don't want a thousand little checks for twenty five dollars because Mrs. Jones in there asking her doctor a question. I mean, so the whole system's designed just to flay you open nonstop. I got a an, an infection in my elbow recently. They still don't know what caused it. It might have been I went down the. Houston to help with the hurricane efforts down there. Um, so it might have been from that. But I went to one orthopedic surgeon who told me I needed surgery. And I inherently didn't trust him, right? Because I know that's how he buys his Porsches and his, his, his expensive house. So inherently, there's distrust there. And so I went and got a second opinion. And I actually checked Yelp reviews, which is interesting, because I don't think that used to happen. You used to just trust whoever your doctor sent you to, and that's who you went to. Um, and he didn't, this first guy didn't have great reviews. So I went to one that had great reviews and, and he was like, no, we're not going to do surgery. We're going to um, get you on antibiotics. He's more conservative and I'm fine. Right. And so I think the same thing applies with us in our profession. I think Gordon Christensen's written some really good stuff about how the dental industry has, um, uh, slipped. Uh, if you look at Gallup polls, uh, 25 years ago. Um, Dennis used to be the number one or two, you know, top three most trusted, um, professionals. And now we've, we've slipped significantly, um, in that. I don't know where we're at today, but you know, while there is still a lot of trust in Dennis, there's also a pretty big part of the population that has lost trust. And they, um, a lot of this is, is the fault of these, uh, some of these chains, uh, who are really focused on efficiency and, um, you know, and I'm not demonizing all these chains, don't get me wrong. I mean, it's not like they're all Satan. But I, I do think there's a, there's a fair amount of pressure that a lot of these um, dental chains put on their dentists uh, to produce unnecessary pressure. I think it's, it's common. It happens. Um, and so I think, I think revisiting and kind of um, hitting the reset button and trying to figure out how we can structure, structure – dental insurance um, to align incentives between patients and providers, I think would be amazing. And I, I want to be a part of that process in whatever way I can. Well, well, trust is everything when you're uh, selling the invisible. I mean, when you come to me and I tell you I have four cavities, I mean, you don't know that, but you know, if your Starbucks coffee is empty and you want a second one, you know, you trust a brand like an iPhone, uh, you trust a can of Coca-Cola, but you don't know if you need, surgery on your elbow you don't know if you have four cavities and i i think one of the things i've noticed the most in my 55 laps around the sun is that social media has destroyed trust i mean there's so much uh i mean right now you look at all these uh, articles posted on facebook twitter linkedin google plus i mean it, it's to the point now where I, I i can't really trust anyone and everybody i talk to i mean fake news is the the biggest um, the biggest term, new term I've heard in the last couple of years. In fact, what what do uh, social media and drug dealers um, have in common? What? They call their customers users. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, they, they sell an addictive product and, and they, they get you hooked on opioids or fake news or, you know, all this stuff. So, yeah, trust is incredibly and, – and, and dentistry um, – dentistry – a lot of that is their fault. I mean, going all the way back to the Reader's Digest article 25 years ago where the guy took a set of study models and an FMX to 25, no, 30 different dentists. And how many different treatment plans did he get? 30. <laughs> Probably 30, yeah. 30, all the way from $0 to 30000 So then the government looked at that. I think it was the NIH. I need to track that down. They looked at that and they said, is that for real or was that, you know, um, crazy journalism? I mean, it was Reader's Digest. I mean, that, that book sat on every grandma and grandpa's new, uh, nightstand. So they went yeah. and they, they increased the sample size to 100 and they got 98 different dream plans because the first two people said you needed nothing. So then treatment plan three to a hundred, not one of them was a duplicate. And huh. so when Dennis, uh, and look at Dental Town, I mean, you could post a picture of, of just a, of anything 
And look at what those, I mean, you know, someone could post a chip tooth and someone will start screaming veneers, another one's Invisalign, bleaching, you know, direct bonding, smooth out. I mean, dentistry is not a consistent product like an iPhone. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, it's very subjective. So you're a Harvard MBA. What practice management software system did you go to to run these multi-location dental offices in a mobile? Uh, so we use, we currently use Open Dental. So do um, I. So do I. Yeah, Open All Dental. the smartest great. MBAs do. <laughs> yeah, it's great. I mean, it's it's not sexy or anything, but it's it's functional, it's intuitive, it's cheap. And it's open. I mean, you can actually program to it. I mean, if you yeah. wanted to, I mean, I got five programmers because of Dental Town. And if there's something that you want to do with it special, I mean, that, that was the whole reason um, Jordan Sparks started. He was a dentist. He had Dentrix. He was just trying to pull out his own customers' addresses. And he noticed not only could he not, but he realized they went out of their way to make sure he couldn't do it. And he called them up and he goes, this is my data. This is my patience. We entered it. I want to export that. And they were like, no. And that, that, was, yeah, I, that I, was the birth of Open Dental, just pissing off Jordan Sparks. <laughs> I wish someone would create a, uh, a one-stop solution for practice management. I mean, it's, it's insane how many different uh, checks we have to cut every month to, you know, five different people from open dental to dental into to yappy to, um, you know, well, I wish, you, I wish someone would. I'll tell you, I'll tell you what you got right now. You have uh, so Jordan's a dentist. He started open dental. That really wasn't his, his heart and soul. His, it's his brother, Nathan now, who's been running that for the last decade. Nathan is the only guy I've met in the whole practice software deal is totally open. And so if you sat down with him or you met him or you told him, I mean, he's already taught, he's talking to every member of my team. Cause you know, I have to pull this stuff out of Peachtree accounting and then stuff mm -hmm. out of open dental and make spreadsheets. And he's like, dude, we'll automate all that. Just, just tell us what you want. Just tell us what you need. So he's one of those guys where I, if really smart people like yourself, um, establish a relationship with them. I mean, the guy, I think the guy hired four more programmers last month. I mean, they're really scaling and they don't do any advertising. They're the only practice management software system that doesn't do any advertising because they're, they're, they're growing faster than they even want to grow. So if you cool. told him what you needed and you told him you were a Harvard MBA and this is what we need and blah, blah, blah. He, he's all ears, man. He's completely approachable. Yeah, I'd love to. If you could connect us, that'd be great. Yeah, I will. I'll we'll do it. Now. So then, the, the obvious question: I only got you for two more minutes. I can't believe it. That was the fastest hour ever. How do you feed these? Uh, the like this new upcoming office. How do, how are you finding your new patients? What's your secret marketing sauce? <laughs> I don't know that we have a secret sauce. I mean, we've done a lot of uh, obviously a lot of due diligence, um, both inside the dental industry. And uh, outside, but it, it's a mix of, uh, you know, online and print. I mean, we still do print. In Austin, we did billboards, really fun billboards. Um, we still do mailers, uh, particularly when we open. Um, we did some magazine ads as well here. Uh, you know, a lot of social media, a lot of social media, geotargeting. So it, it's, you know, it's a mix between the local businesses around where we are. So it's, uh, you know, it's kind of a multi, multi throng strategy, but yeah, we, I don't know that we have necessarily a total secret sauce. I think it's more just about execution, right? It's just about doing it and doing it, doing it well. So we've learned, I mean, we weren't perfect on our first practice by any means. We learned a lot, um, you know, run through more cash than we thought. <laughs> we haven't been perfect, um, but we've we've learned. We've learned a lot, and I think we're we're in a good place right now. So I just emailed um, Nathan. You and me are now on an email string. So let's uh, oh, cool. let's just take it from there. Um, yeah, he I is. I, I just love Nathan. I mean, he's just so damn cool. Um, so the million dollar question. Um, you said you were on a Yelp review. You're 38. I'm 55. I've never seen a Yelp review, and I've never been at a uh, restaurant with a bunch of uh, grandpa dentists. I've never seen. I've never physically seen anyone use Yelp in my life. Uh, but I do. <laughs> I do have the Uber app, though. I've never used it. And Ryan says it's all ready to go. You know, I'm just sitting there thinking of like if I'm lost someday. But um, 
um, these young kids, they want to go live in Cupertine. They want to live where all the Googles and Ubers and Facebooks, they want to live by you in Austin and Dell and Amazon. And, and I notice out here you're in Tempe and Queen Creek. Um, do demographics matter? Um, do you, are you of the free spirit, um, the, the Janis Joplin, you know, freedom is when you have nothing left to lose. And if you want to live, you know, if you want to live right here, you just live there and be happy. Uh, happiness is what it's all about. Or would you be coaching these kids coming out $350,000 in debt, some of them $400,000 in debt, um, to study demographics, go rural. I mean, talk demographics when, when as you're rolling out your, um, Lydian Dental Centers, what are you thinking um, in terms of demographics? Yeah, I love that you quoted, you dropped Janis Joplin. I grew up uh, a fan of Janis Joplin. My dad loves, loves her. Actually, on our South Lamar clinic, on the side of our clinic, um, we have this big wall uh, that we're doing a mural on, and she's actually in that mural, Janis ah, Joplin. Ah, cool. So come to Austin. Come to Austin sometime. We'll grab some barbecue. Um uh, well, you know, Janice, Janice actually was right. I mean, I, I learned that first. I, I, I think I had my first eureka moment on happiness um, straight out of dental school. I did a missionary dental trip down in Chiapas. And, you know, I had oh, yeah. opened up my office and I was all busy and I was working around the clock and everything was crazy. And a friend of mine, Jerome Smith, convinced me that I need to take four days off and go down there. And I had babies at home and and, and I just thought everything. But I, I just did it. And I went down there and I saw 5,000 Chiapan Indians with no electricity, no running water, no nothing. And they were the happiest people I'd ever seen in my life. All they <laughs> did was giggle. They thought everything <laughs> was funny. All they did was it was It was just family, babies, a simple diet. They had zero awesome. stress. They didn't own a car. They didn't have house insurance. They didn't have student loans. And you couldn't yeah. beat the smile off their face with a stick. In fact, yeah. if you start hitting them in the face with a stick, they'd probably just start giggling and run. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, I had a similar experience down in Chile when I was a missionary down there. Um, first Christmas I saw was very simple, but the happiest family gift exchange I'd ever seen. Um, deodorant and socks and basic basic stuff, but completely happy. Um, but yeah, demographics. Um, you know, I think you have to recognize who your target market is um, first. So um, if you if you want to, we've, we've picked, we've selected markets that are pretty competitive actually um, in nature. And so in these markets, we've had to execute really well on our marketing, on, on everything, right? But if you want to, um, I, I think if you're a solo dentist just coming out of school, I think if you were to enter the markets that we're in right now, I think it would be, it would definitely be a battle for sure. Um, I think you mentioned these kind of more less dense underserved areas. I mean, I think, I think those are areas where you can come out with, with less sophistication, with less of a business plan behind you and still hang a shingle and, and do just fine. Um, there are some really good third parties that you can use. Scott McDonald, uh, is one I'd throw out there. But every single, every single market will have um, brokers, typically dental brokers, uh, that can do that for you. Um, and they can sit down and say, what's your plan? They can make a plan with you. Um, but I would say, yeah, if you're going to go into a market that's competitive where the, the concentration of, you know, uh, the ratio of patients, uh, the population to dentist ratio is anywhere south of, 2000 um you better have a very sophisticated plan behind you to to do well no doubt no doubt last question we're three minutes in overtime um so amazon might come there amazon um just uh, released the other day they bought licenses for pharmaceutical dispensing in 13 different states i mean now now they're going off to after walgreens and cvs do you do you, uh they had a booth at the greater new york last year um the Greater New York is the day after Thanksgiving in New York City, uh, but Amazon was there last year. Um, who are you buying supplies from, and do you think Amazon's going to come in and disrupt that space? Uh, I think, I think if the dental um, suppliers in the space don't take Amazon seriously, I think um, they're going to be in trouble for sure. I think Amazon's going to come and compete. Um, 
I we use Burkhart. Uh, I'm a I'm a huge fan. Uh, we we actually uh, in our, our first mobile clinic. I'll just tell a quick anecdote. Put a plug in for for Burkhart. Their service is is phenomenal. We, I you know we could go with Shiner Patterson, who they have they actually have built a lot of um, capabilities to service bigger DSOs. Um, but we stick with Burkhart because of, of their service. And we had one of the reps here in Austin. Uh, we had these little uh, dental assistant carts, right, with these drawers. Uh, but we didn't have, they didn't build separators into the drawers. And my dental assistant was like, man, I wish I had little separators in here so I could, you know, um, organize all my supplies. And the rep was like, oh, you know what? I'll, I'll go home and get my saw and uh, I'll make you dividers. So he came, it was like middle of the summer. Guy came down during the day, sweating his face off, and um, and sawed her out little dividers uh, for the whole cabinet. And they they are always there. I mean, as far as service goes, um, you know, they're there. Are you friends every- with the CEO? Uh, no, I'm not. Now that is a that is just a classic American business. I mean, you know. Um, the Fortune 500 employees, like 17% of Americans, the whole world's built on small business and their family business. I mean, you go into, you, you, anytime a patient comes in there in the military, I say, well, are you the first one in your family to be in the military? And they're like, oh no, my uncle was in the Marines and my dad served, you know, it's uh, same thing with dentists. You go into any dental school, raise your hand if there's another dentist in your family tree somewhere. And it's between a quarter and a third of all the hands and I've lectured in 50 different countries. I lectured in five continents last year. And Burkhart is a, uh, Benko is a third generation family owned business. Burkhart's a fourth generation. It's a 150 year old company. And she's the great granddaughter of the founder. And I'm, and we've had this explosion of women dentists. She, I think she must be very shy because I've, I've emailed the Burkhart management team and say, come on. I mean, I, I think her unique selling proposition. I mean, couldn't she get a bunch of women dentists just to buy from her because just for the fact that she's a woman and right now on every newspaper is Harvey Weinstein. And, and I mean, I, I, I think those women would stick together. I think the best marketing she could do would be to come on the show and tell us about this fourth generation family business. Cause it's really a very romantic story. I mean, yeah, it's, it's I, lo- a, I love those guys. I'm a big fan. Yeah. In fact, a lot of people always thought, uh, uh, Ben Coat, Benco, which is really dominant on the East Coast, and Burkhardt dominant on the West Coast, that they'd merge and be the ultimate coast-to-coast national player. But they're both family businesses. That, that, that's not even on their radar screen. It's not even a goal, whatever. Um, but um, inter- interesting times. Well, I'll tell you what, man. You are a fascinating man. And it was just a huge honor to get you to come on my show today and talk to my homies. Ryan and I were so damn excited. If I, Since I couldn't get into Harvard uh um, business school. If I just sent you my ASU diploma, would you at least just sign it for me? And then I can study. <laughs> that is the most ridiculous thing. I can say, well, I only got a degree from ASU, but it's signed by a Harvard MBA. But um, <laughs> and uh, my gosh, and Regina uh, Hertzlinger getting her on the show to talk about disruptive because I, I think that's another thing. Fifty-five laps around the sun. It seems like when I was little, from like ten to twenty to thirty. Progress was just very, very slow, but it looks like the, yeah. the, the, the disruptive forces in the economy. I mean, it seems like every 10 years, it seems, it seems like the disruption last five years previously would have taken 10 years and previously would have taken 20 yeah. years. I mean, everything is just going faster, 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 faster. So I agree. I think uh, we're going to see disruption in uh, Amazon and, uh, and, you know, um, they just had the CEO, they just re- put a new CEO in Patterson. And I thought the most telling sign of that was that you think it would have been their biggest, baddest, best regional manager that's got 20, 30 years of skin in the game. And they didn't. They brought in an outside business consultant. And I thought, hmm, I hmm. wonder if he plans on running Patterson or selling all those distribution rights to Amazon. I mean, it totally, uh, totally, um, totally was a, a didn't didn't see that coming. They're they're definitely not going down any traditional road to bring in who they just yeah. brought in as a CEO. So yeah, and I hope you disrupt the uh, the dental insurance industry, the supply industry. It, it's all going to be disrupted, and it's going to start getting disrupted at the speed of light. I mean, it's going to be there'll probably be more change in the next five years than there was in the last ten. But hey, uh, you're mm-hmm. the first person I ever podcasted that's sitting in a car, and uh, so this <laughs> is a first for me. 
and I will repost that uh, Wired magazine article today, and then I'll send you a link on Dentaltown so you can post some of your mobile clinic pictures. And on YouTube, cool. you know that you, when if you post on YouTube, you know they got that share button, but right next to it is embed where you can pick up the code. And then if you go to Dentaltown, there's a little YouTube uh, icon above a post. You click that and drop that embed. You can uh, drop your YouTube video. And a lot of you guys out there listening got some amazing videos you put. Uh, you you can explode your YouTube video uh, views by uh, dropping them in a thread on Dentaltown. And uh, but uh, man, Josh, thank you so much for your time. And uh, next time you're in Phoenix, we'll have to go grab some barbecue. That sounds awesome. All right, buddy. I hope you Thank have you a rocking hot day. And best of luck with those uh, four kids. I'm jealous. I wanted uh, one little girl named Megan. I got four little boys. And you got your girl right out of the gate. And now so uh, <laughs> the three boys are just extra. So uh, on that note, I hope you have a rocking hot day. Hey, thanks, Howard. I appreciate your time.